Hello everybody. In this lecture, we'll talk about the role of occlusion in restoration of teeth. We'll talk about the importance of recreating the occlusal morphology while we are putting restorations in the mouth, be it amalgam, composite, inlay, onlay, or even crowns. You see, it's very important that the restoration is anatomically correct and functionally in harmony with the system. If not so, it disrupts the system, creating an imbalance of forces, and we do not want that. So this is what we are going to learn in this lecture. Let's go ahead. While placing a restoration, a dentist must make an effort to create an occlusion that best suits with the oral environment. And how is that achieved? That is achieved by good occlusion. And good occlusion is that which is comfortably adapted by the patient. A restoration is designed in a manner that it does not produce any disturbance in the normal condylar path. That means after you have a restoration in the mouth, there should not be any deviation of the mandible during mouth closure. So, while developing a restoration, care is taken that occlusal morphology is reproduced in a manner that when, a, when the mouth is closed, there is maximum stability of the mandible and minimum amount of force is placed on each tooth in function. The importance of occlusal morphology is that the magnitude and direction of load on the tooth gets influenced by it. Now you can understand the importance of your dental anatomy carving classes, right? Now how does the forces get influenced by occlusal morphology? You can see in the diagram, this is a tooth it is placed in a bony socket with intervening periodontal ligament fibers. Now the bone does not tolerate occlusal forces well. It is these periodontal ligament fibers which are made up of collagen that get stretched under the influence of occlusal forces and they act as shock absorbers. Now what kind of occlusal morphology do we want? We want an occlusal morphology where the tip of the cusp contacts a flat surface, which may be bottom of a fossa or crest of a marginal ridge. When this happens, the occlusal forces, they get directed vertically along the long axis of the tooth. You can see it here. The forces are directed along the long axis of the tooth and this is what we want. And the periodontal ligament fibers, they are arranged in such a manner that they can tolerate this force well. And so this force easily gets dissipated and does not result in any bone resorption. Now when the occlusal morphology is such that the cusp tip contacts an incline like this. Now the resultant forces they develop a horizontal component like this here and here and this can lead to tipping of the teeth. Here you can see horizontal component of force it creates the fibers of the periodontal ligament here gets compressed and due to pressure bone resorption occurs here. Here bone resorption results. On the opposite side the fibers they get stretched and tension is created. Similarly here pressure resulting in bone resorption. Now, because of these imbalanced forces, the tooth tends to tip. Overall, the forces are not effectively dissipated to the bone, which results in bone resorption. Now, improper forces can have adverse influence like tooth fracture, tooth jiggling or mandibular deflection. Now, you can see a horizontal component of force acting on this cusp. This can result in fracture of the cusp tooth jiggling or mandibular deflection. That means your mandible deviates slightly during mouth closure. Now the process of directing occlusal forces through the long axis of the tooth is known as axial loading. And how do we achieve this? We can achieve it by making cusp tip to fossa contact like here. This is cusp tip to fossa contact. Either we develop the restoration like this or surface to surface contact like this or tripoid contacts. Now if we develop cusps in such a manner 
then the occlusal forces will most probably be directed along the long axis of the tooth and that process will be called axial loading. Now to achieve proper axial loading, it is important that the occlusal forces are directed along the long axis of the teeth. But the axes of maxillary and mandibular teeth, they have different angulations as they are shown here. See, as you see in this diagram, this is slightly inclined. Here they are straight like this. They are all different. Now these axes vary with the arrangement and location of the teeth. And so why is it important? They have to be kept in mind when the restorations are being designed. So we should know the angulation of the teeth depending upon the location and therefore keeping that angulation in mind we make restoration so our occlusal forces they get directed along the long axis of the teeth. Now coming to the restoration of anterior teeth. Anterior teeth are restored to the normal shape and contour. On mouth closing no heavy contacts should be there between the upper and the lower anterior teeth. Now, if these contacts develop, they will tend to displace the teeth anteriorly or cause heavy vibration known as fremitus. In buccal, lingual, anterior, posterior or any other bendibular border movement, the upper and the lower teeth should bypass the opponents without collisions or contacts. This is very important. During all type of mandibular movements, the teeth should not bang against each other, the anterior teeth we are talking about. You can see in the first diagram that the occlusal anatomy is properly developed in this crown that has been given to this tooth. So now when the opposing tooth, that the lower tooth comes in contact with the upper, the forces are vertically directed. Now in this diagram, the occlusal anatomy or the morphology is not properly developed. So on contacting the lower tooth, the two components of forces develop a vertical component and a horizontal component. Now this unfavorable development distribution of force can result in pain, mobility, drifting, decementation de and so on. Therefore it, is, therefore it is important that both extracoronal and intracoronal restorations should conform to the proper occlusal outline. This is a crown, this is a composite restoration or amalgam or GIC or anything but they are not violating the occlusal anatomy. Coming to the restoration of posterior teeth, the same principles apply in posterior teeth as well. Now you can see this is a normal tooth and its contacts, occlusal forces well directed along the long axis of the tooth. Now a restoration has been given here in which the contacts have been recreated and so the occlusal forces are directed favorably. So therefore, all the restoration should be done in a manner that it is in harmony with the favorable load distribution. Now let us come to a clinical situation. A person comes to you for restoration. You make him sit, you open his mouth, you examine and you discover that his mouth is full of deficient anatomy-less restorations. So in this case, it becomes very hard for you to develop proper occlusal surface and proximal contacts. And also, it is not practically possible to redo all the existing restorations. So what do you do? So under these circumstances, the best option available for you is to at least recontour and reshape the restoration present adjacent to and opposing the new restoration so that you can make reasonable functional relationship. Also, the anatomic features of the existing restorations, that means the ones which are present in the mouth, they are not used as a standard while preparing the new restoration. Remember, not used. Now coming to another type of situation. Sometimes in a clinical setup, you see that there are restorations which are impressive neither anatomically nor functionally, yet the patient has no complaint. Now, why is that? What happens is adjustments occur according to the tooth position throughout a life of a person, which may be due to natural, traumatic or pathological changes or following a dental procedure. However, 
within the adaptive capacity of the masticatory system a balance of forces is maintained now when an imbalance of forces occurs beyond the adaptive range then it comes out as pain drifting mobility etc so that means your mouth to a certain extent does adapt to the changes which have occurred but the important point is why must we play with the system now here you can see this is a case of a long standing low amalgam restoration see how low it is like a ditch now what would be the possible consequences or outcomes of such a restoration in a mouth let us proceed step wise we ask the patient to close his mouth in intercuspal position we observe that there are stable occlusal contacts present here and here next we ask the patient to shift his mandible laterally to the right or the left side and we see that no contact occurs during lateral shifting this is what we wanted we don't want the upper and the lower tooth to hit against each other now a cavity is cut in the maxillary molar the cavity is filled with amalgam and the amalgam is overcarved that means the amalgam filling is low the contact here is lost which was present in this slide in this picture what we observe after some time is that the mandibular tooth shifts itself to a more stable intercuspal position to establish occlusal contacts like this now if you ask the patient to shift his mandible laterally you will see that the upper and the lower tooth they hit against each other and this is this will cause deflection of the mandible or produce unfavorable forces in the tooth and this is what we did not want similarly a high restoration can produce its own side effects harmful effects rather it can cause pain in the individual tooth repeated failure or uncementing of the restoration the opposing tooth may wear down there might be difficulty in chewing and in severe cases the pain must may be associated with muscles of mastication and tmj and it can also cause unrelated facial pains and we will wonder that we are having pain in the face but no possible cause obvious cause and it can be just a high restoration You see, anatomically carved restorations, while appealing to the eye, may be biological failures if they are not in functional harmony with the occlusion. You can see a beautifully carved restoration, and when you ask the patient to close his mouth, it might just be too high or it might be too low. So it's very important to have functionally correct restorations. Mouth being the best articulator, as far as possible, any deficiency in occlusal morphology should be intercepted and corrected by adequate occlusal adjustment alone. Now, how do we make occlusal adjustments? Occlusal adjustments can be made by selective reshaping and grinding of the restorations. And to achieve this, it is necessary first to evaluate the restoration. Sorry, the occlusion. now how do we evaluate our occlusion when our when we complete a restoration like amalgam composite or inlay onlay or even a crown occlusal evaluation should be performed to ensure that the intercuspal contacts are consistent and stable to do this we make the patient sit upright with the frankfurt plane horizontal to the ground to the floor and the head unsupported and we use firstly gnathosonics what is that gnathosonic is a use of sound to assess the occlusal contacts how do we do it we ask the patient to tap his teeth together slowly and then forcefully in intercuspal position when we do it what should be there the sound of the resulting tooth contacts should be sharp reproducible and solid suggesting good icp consistency what should not be there the tooth contacts making dull or soft sound or multiple sliding sounds due to poor contact relation 
Next is use of tooth markings. We can do it with help of articulating paper, articulating ribbons, waxes, paste, sprays or paint on materials. Articulating paper you people use very often in your clinics. With articulating paper, accurate marking of the tooth contacts can be done. For this purpose, the articulating paper or foil is used, which should be as thin as possible, such as ash blue, Detex red or GHM occlusal foil. A thin paper would mark only small points of true contacts. If you use a thick paper, it will mark large areas of surrounding the point of contact, making your adjustments quite difficult. The teeth are dried and the patient is asked to close on the articulating paper, pressing the teeth together. You can see here, blue and red, blue and red articulating papers have been used and these mark the points of contact of the teeth, showing good intercuspal con consistency. What should be there? The tooth markings should show appropriate cusp fossa contacts or cusp marginal ridge contacts. The contact should be multiple and bilaterally distributed. What should not be there? Absence of contacts on the restored teeth or excessive contact on a restored tooth. All this data has been taken from textbook of operative dentistry by Sumita Sandhu from the chapter of occlusion. I hope you liked this lecture. In case you did, you please like, comment and share. And of course, subscribe to this channel if you want to have more updates. Thank you.